Yes, I have this hope Death for my soul In the flood or the fire You're with me, you won't let go Hello and welcome to this special edition version of our Sunday morning worship service. We want to remind you that as of June the 7th, we have begun in-person worship right here at South Kendall Community Church. And at the same time, we understand that many of you are unable to attend in person for a variety of different reasons. This is why we're bringing you this online worship service. And we want to let you know that we miss you, we love you, we're praying for you, and we hope to see you very soon. Today we conclude our study in the book of Philippians and the title for our series in Philippians has been Rejoice and we're putting the emphasis on the word re. We want God to renew in us the joy of the Lord and as we've worked our way through each of these sermons we've been asking ourselves two questions. The first one is what is the foundation of our joy as Christians and then the second question is what does it mean for us to remain in the joy of the Lord even though we go through difficult times? Now today for our final sermon in Philippians, we are focusing on Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 through 20. And the title for our sermon today is Giving and Receiving. And we're going to see what God's design for us and what does it mean for us to receive in a way that honors God? And what does it mean for us to give in a way that pleases God as well? I'm trusting it's going to be a blessing for you and for everyone listening this morning. Picture of the week. This one comes to us from the Pierre family. Yes, this is Ariella Pierre celebrating her fourth birthday. Yes, this is one of our coveted children here at the church and you can see it right there on the sign that she's wearing. It's my birthday and we celebrate with Ariella today and as we look at this picture, you know what? I'm reminded of what Jesus Christ said when he told his disciples, unless you change and become like one of these little ones, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so my prayer is, as we look at this picture, that we'll see ourselves in Ariella, that we'll be reminded that we are the children of God because of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And one of the names that the Bible has for Jesus is that He is our Good Shepherd. Our call to worship this morning comes to us from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, through Psalm 23, we are reminded of a promise that has been preached to your people for millennia, Lord. We want to thank you, God, for your Son, who is our faithful shepherd. Thank you, God, that for him to become our shepherd, he had to become the Lamb of God, and that Jesus laid down his life for us, that he died in order, to, in order for us to receive the forgiveness of our sins, in order for us to have a relationship with you, Father in heaven. And so, Father, we are here to declare that we are the sheep of your pasture and that Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. And we are here to follow him 
as he leads us through this worship service. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. May we worship you, God, in spirit and in truth. And we hold on to that promise that Jesus Christ made when he said to his followers, when two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And all of God's people agreed and said, Amen. church. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, we see the story of how God rescued his people out of slavery from Egypt, from the evil Pharaoh. And in the New Testament, we see how Jesus Christ rescues all of his people from the dominion of darkness under the most evil one, Satan, and delivers us into the kingdom of light. And as Romans 6 says, he frees us from our bondage to slavery, to sin, and he makes us slaves of righteousness. And that is something that we can be joyful about as we pr praise and sing our great deliverer, our redeemer, the one who rescues us, and the one who is our ever-present help in times of trouble. Let's sing Rescuer this morning. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. And he's our rescuer, he's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound! Oh, how grace abounds! We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. He is beauty for the blind man, and riches for the poor. He is friendship for the one the world ignores. He is pasture for the weary and rest for those who strive. For oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, and the life. And He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. So come and be chainless, come and be fearless, come to the foot of Calvary. There is redemption for every affliction. Here at the foot of Calvary So come and be chainless Come and be fearless Come to the foot of Calvary There is redemption For every affliction Here at the foot of Calvary He's our rescuer, He's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. Today I have a big question for you. 
Are you needy? Usually when we think of someone who's needy, we may think of someone who's in desperate need of money. But did you know that you and I and all human beings are very, very needy? What are some of our basic needs? Well, some are easy, like we need food and water. But we also need deeper things, like we need love. We need to be valued. We need to have purpose. We like to have something that we're supposed to be doing. And our great need is to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You know, I was thinking that during this time of the coronavirus, maybe we're feeling our needs a little bit more. Maybe you're feeling bored, like you don't have that much purpose anymore. Every day is just the same thing and we're at home so much. Or maybe you're feeling a little scared or anxious, nervous. There's so many questions. Are we going to have to wear these masks forever? But today's verse has an amazing promise for us. It's Philippians 4 verse 19 and I'm going to ask us to read it all together whether you're here at church with us or whether you're at home. Are you ready? Let's read. My God will supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Wow! Did you hear that? God just made a promise to you and to me that he would take care of all of our needs. And there's so many ways that God is taking care of our needs. Let's think this week about what he's done in order to take care of us. He's given us a family to give us our food and our water, our love to give us value. He's also given us different things that we can do. Look this week for ways that maybe you could do a little extra schoolwork to get ahead. Maybe you could read an extra book that you don't have to read. Maybe you could help your mom a little bit more in the house and do some work there. Or maybe outside you could do some work. Maybe you could do a fun project and just learn that way. So God has provided and he's given us purpose for living. And then let's remember that God has given us the greatest answer to our needs. He's given us Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus came to this earth. He lived, he died, but he rose again in order to forgive our sins and give us a relationship with God. So this week, let's be on the lookout for the big and the little ways that God is supplying and taking care of all of our needs. And let's thank him for those ways. I'll see you next week. Bye. Good morning. Our scripture reading is taken from Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 20. Thanks for their gifts. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid and more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. 
I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Aphrodite the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to these riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever received a gift that you repackaged and gave to somebody else? It's one of those gifts that keeps on giving. I remember when my wife and I had just gotten married that people were so generous. They gave us so many gifts. And really, there were some gifts that we weren't ever going to use. So we decided that Christmas... Um, of our first year of marriage to give some of those gifts away to people for Christmas. And so uh, we got together with my wife's family. And one of the differences between my wife's family and my family, which is we're all the same family, is that in my family, when we were growing up, when it came to opening presents on Christmas, it was every man for himself. It was a free for all. It was you opened all your presents as fast as you could. But in my wife's family, they have a little different uh, tradition. It's they open one present at a time. So as we gather together with family for our first Christmas uh, together with my wife's family, uh, we gave this gift that we had repackaged and we're going to give to this particular relative. Now, here's the thing. When we had received this present, it was one of the presents that at our wedding that we didn't know who gave it to us because we never found a card. We never found a sticker. We didn't know who it came from. So when we gave this present to this particular individual on Christmas, uh, they were so thankful, they opened up the box, and when they opened up the box, a card fell out. And when the person opened up the card and started reading it, the card said, congratulations, Felix and Carrie, on your wedding. So when this person looked at the card, they looked up at us, then they looked at their gift. Then they figured out that if we had given them a present that somebody had given to us at our wedding. So they handed us the card because we didn't know what the card said. And when we looked at it, we were like, congratulations on your wedding. Oh my goodness. It was one of the most embarrassing things we had ever experienced in our young married lives together. Well, today's sermon is about giving and it's about receiving. We're gonna learn about how to give in a way that honors God and how to receive in a way that honors God. And my prayer as we work through today's sermon is that we will see that all the gifts that we give and all the gifts that we receive have really come from God. That they're just merely gifts that have been repackaged and given to others because they ultimately come from God. So let's begin by focusing on the gift of giving. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So the book of Philippians ends, because this is our last sermon in Philippians uh, in our series, the book ends the same way that the book began, with the Apostle Paul thanking God for these Christians in the city of Philippi. Let me show you what he said at the beginning of the book in chapter 1. He said in Philippians 1, 4 through 5, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So he opens up the book by thanking God for their partnership in the ministry. So how exactly did these believers in Philippi partner with the Apostle Paul? Let me show you two ways that they partnered. If we go down in chapter 1, down to verse number 19, he said this, For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, 
that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So what's the first way that they partnered with the Apostle Paul? It was through prayer. This was a praying church. Let me show you the second way that they partnered with the Apostle Paul, and that's in chapter 4, verse 16, in the passage that we're reading today. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. So the second way that they partnered with the Apostle Paul was through giving. So listen, this church was a church full of faith. That's why they prayed. And this church was also a church that was full of love. That's why they gave. And if we go to 2 Corinthians, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul mentions the church at Philippi. And there's something that he says in 2 Corinthians that will actually give us a greater appreciation for the kind of giving that this church was doing. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1-4. through 4. Look at what he says here. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. So Macedonia is the region, and inside that region were churches like the Thessalonians, the Bereans, and the Philippian church. Okay, so he's talking about the Philippian church here. Look at what he says in verse 2. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy, and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So let's stop right there. What was the church undergoing as they were being generous towards the ministry of God? They were going through severe trials. They were facing extreme poverty. But despite these realities, look at how the, the Apostle Paul describes their giving in the following verses of 2 Corinthians 8. He says, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. So let me ask you, was this church waiting to pay off all of their bills before they gave? Was this church waiting to get out of debt before partnering with the ministry of the Apostle Paul? Were they, waiting, were they waiting for everything to be perfect? No, it was actually the exact opposite. They were giving in hard times. These Christians in the church of Philippi had a pattern of giving faithfully to the ministry of God, whether they were facing good times or whether they were facing hard times, and it seems like they were facing a lot of hard times. I'm reminded of the story of Jesus Christ with his disciples as they stood out in front of the temple, in front of the temple treasury. And the Bible tells us in the Gospels that there was a bunch of people that were coming, bringing their offering, dropping it in the temple treasury, uh, very wealthy people, middle class people, and then this poor widow showed up. And she only had two small coins. And she dropped those two small coins in the temple treasury. Probably didn't make any noise. I'm sure that she was maybe even weeping as she remembered the loss of her husband as she gave this gift to the temple of God. And when that happened, Jesus called his disciples over. And he said to them, you see that lady right there? She has given more than anybody else has given today. Well, I imagine the disciples were confused. They were like, what do you mean, Jesus? I, I got my calculator right in my hand and I can pretty much guarantee you that she's not the one who gave the most. She's probably the one who has given the least today in the collection of the, the temple service today. But then Jesus said this in Mark chapter 12, verse 44. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So let me ask you a question. How big is your God? Notice that I did not ask you, how big is your offering? No. I asked, how big is your God? Because this widow Right here in Mark chapter 12, the church at Philippi, they won the award. 
not for giving the most, but in trusting God the most. I want to take you back to Philippians chapter 4, and I want you to see again what the Apostle Paul says about the giving of the church at Philippi. He says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, I, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So the Apostle Paul is saying that something happened. You were giving consistently, you were giving faithfully, but something interrupted your ability to give. We don't know what it was. But now they had made another collection. They had sent it with a man named Epaphroditus. I believe that's in verse 18 of the same chapter. And Epaphroditus came and brought that offering to the Apostle Paul. And when the Apostle Paul received that offering, he responds by sending this letter. And in this letter here in verse 18, he says, At last you have renewed your concern for me. This is a very powerful word. This is an agricultural word. It, it describes a, a tree that's, that's been withered or maybe that has withered or has been cut back. And, but now it's sprouting back again. Now it's producing fruit again. It's, it's flourishing again. I, I have this avocado tree in the front of my house. It's, it's a very big avocado tree. And, and a couple years ago, we had to cut it back because we were afraid that if a hurricane came, it was going to knock, it was going to fall over on top of the house. So we, we trimmed the tree back. And, but over the last two years, this tree sprouted back again. And this year, let me show you what's growing on the branches of the tree. You see right here, we got some avocados. Yes, those are real size avocados. They're, they're the size of a football. That's how big these avocados are that grow on my tree. And so what's happening to the tree? It had been cut back, but now it's flourishing again. Now it's producing fruit once again. So what am I trying to say? My prayer, as you reflect on the kind of giving that this church in the city of Philippi was doing. As you think about the condition that they were in as they gave to the work of God, that God, through what we're saying right here, will renew in you, will reignite in you a renewed desire to give to the work of God. That you in faith will step out trusting that God will bless you as you bless others with what He has given you. I, I'm, I'm praying that as we hear these words, that we will experience firsthand the words of Jesus when He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So in our sermon today, we're, we're talking about two things. We're talking about giving and we're talking about receiving. Uh, how to give in a way that honors God, but also how to receive in a way that honors God. You see, because the, the Apostle Paul is, is thanking the church for the gift that they've given to him, but he's also now going to take an opportunity to teach them about a very important principle in the Christian life. Let me show you what it is. Look at what he said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. The Apostle Paul is thanking them, but now he's going to teach them about something really important, and that is contentment. He says here in verse 11 that he had to learn what contentment was all about. And then if we go to verse number 12 in the same chapter, he says this, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. What's the Apostle Paul saying here? He's talking about contentment. That contentment was something that he had to learn. That's verse 11. Here in verse 12, he's saying that contentment was actually a secret about contentment is what he had to learn. So what is he talking about here? So let's, first of all, let's talk about contentment. What is contentment? Well, let's begin by talking about this. What's not contentment? So for that, we go back to the Old Testament, to the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to show you what the Tenth Commandment says. If you look here on the bottom 
of your of the screen on the bottom right side, my, my right side. But anyway, it says here, you shall not covet. As we seek to understand what it means to be content, we have to understand that the opposite of being content is coveting. What is coveting? Well, whenever I think of coveting, what I hear, when I, when I think about coveting, I think about two words. Uh, number one is greed, and the second thing I think about is envy. You see, greed says, I don't have enough, I need more, I need more, I need more, because I'm not satisfied. What does envy say? Envy says, I want what this other person has, and I'm not going to be happy until I get it, and sometimes there's some hatred and resentment towards that person who has what you don't have. So when we put greed together with envy, we've got a very dangerous combination. And I can guarantee you that the person who lives with greed and envy is not on the road to contentment. They're actually on the road to discontentment. They're actually on the road to covetousness, okay? So what is contentment? We know that it's not coveting, it's not covetousness, so what is it? Let me give you a great definition for contentment. This is the, probably the best definition I've, I've heard in all my years of ministry. You ready for this? This is what it means. No need of imports. And when the Apostle Paul was talking about that church's gift that they had given after a long time had passed, he used an agricultural term. He was saying that they're, they're, they now had a renewed desire and concern for him, that, that even though things had been cut back or cut down, now they were flourishing once again. They were sprouting back again. They were giving fruit once again. He used an agricultural term to talk about their giving. But here he's using a shipping term, an, an economic term to describe what contentment is all about. It's like a country that doesn't need any imports. It is fully self-satisfied. It's independent of what others could bring to it, okay? So you get the idea. Kind of think of a, of a freighter coming into the port of Miami, and it's got a ton of containers, and we're basically saying, hey, we don't need that. We don't need that. We have enough with what we have. I think another way to kind of maybe relay it to uh, relate it here to 2020, it would be basically saying, let's bring it right to your front porch. It would be basically saying, I don't need another box from Amazon to be delivered at my house. I have enough. Now we're starting to understand what contentment is all about. So here's what I want to do. I want to take what the Apostle Paul says in verse number 12, and I want to divide it into two columns. On one side, I want to put what he talks about were the hard times that he was going through, and then on the other side, I want to put the good things that he had experienced in his life, and we're going to see how he was able to learn contentment in the good times and in the hard times. So if we look on one side of the column, we see that he says that he, was, he, he learned to be content in times when he was in need, when he was hungry, and when he was living in want. Then he also learned to be content when he was in pl having plenty, when he was well-fed, when he was living in plenty. You see, it's not just being content when you don't have what you wish you had, but it's also learning to be content when you have more than what you expected God to give you, okay? So, but I wanted to say this. The reason why he's bringing this up is because there really is a temptation in moments when we don't get everything we were hoping for God to give us. And there also is another temptation when we receive far more than we were anticipating to receive from God. Let me show you what the temptation is. We got to go to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 through 9 says this, Two things I ask of you, O Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. And here it is. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. 
So the, 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 the person who's writing Proverbs here in Proverbs chapter 30 is saying, God, please don't give me poverty. God, please don't give me riches. Why would he pray that way? Let me show you in the next verse that he says in verse 9. Otherwise, here it is, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? You see, the writer here in Proverbs is saying there's a real danger when you have way more than what you need in life. You're going to think that you're self-made. You're going to be proudful. You're going to doubt the presence of God and His role in your life and you obtaining everything that you've obtained. But then there's also another temptation on the other side of it. Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. So the other temptation when it comes to being poor and not having enough is that we will doubt the goodness of God and start getting involved in things that we shouldn't be involved in. So when we have too little, we have the temptation of doubting the goodness of God because if God's good, why am I suffering in this way? And then when things are going well, the temptation is for us to doubt the presence of God and think that we accomplished it by ourselves. So these are, this is the reality of, in which the Apostle Paul lived. He was in moments that were low and he was in moments that were high. So how was he able to remain content through the ups and downs of life. Oh, you're going to love this because this is Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. Now let me show you what, how he learned to be content from verse number 13. Look at what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I'm so excited to show it to you. Here's what it says. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for the strength that you give us in the good times and in the hard times. You know, many times when we think about this passage of I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, uh, maybe you might get the image of, hey, listen, I can pick up a, a car with my bare hands and rescue somebody who's trapped under a car. Or maybe you think you can run a race and win the, the gold medal. Or, or maybe you need to, pass, to take a test and you need to pass a test and, and you're quoting Philippians 4.13. I even know of one NBA basketball player that has a brand of shoes and, and clothing and whatnot, has an entire brand, and, and it's all based on Philippians 4.13. So what does he think about when he thinks about Philippians 4.13? Is making three-point shots, winning NBA championships. So when we think about how we normally think about Philippians 4.13 is accomplishing things in this life where maybe there's an obstacle that's before us. And, and I think it is true. I think with God, the impossible becomes possible. Amen? But Philippians 4.13 in its proper context, is not talking about God giving you the strength to bench press 400 pounds. That's not what this passage is primarily focused on. Philippians 4.13 is focused on Jesus Christ giving us, giving you the strength that you need to remain content in Christ, to be content in God, no matter what situation that you're facing in this life. And I think that's really the call here, for us to be content in Christ. And when we're content in Christ, we'll be content in whatever happens to us in this world. But there's something else that the Apostle Paul says here in Philippians chapter 4 that helps teach us how he learned about the secret of contentment. Look at what he says in verse 19 in chapter 4. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Notice he, notice he doesn't say that my God will meet some of your needs. No, that God will meet all of your needs. In other words, if you don't have it, it's because you don't need it. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have desires of the heart, that we're crying out to God and asking God to, to give to us. And maybe He will give that to us in the future. But remember, contentment is about no more imports. I have exactly what I need right now in my life. How could the Apostle Paul have so much confidence that God would indeed provide for all of his needs? Look at what he says to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Talking about God. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with Jesus, along with him, graciously give us all things? What's the Apostle Paul saying here? That if God was faithful to give us and meet our greatest need, why would we doubt that he would not meet all of our lesser needs? What was our greatest need? Well, our greatest need is to have a reconciled relationship with God. You see, sin creates division. It creates separation between us and God. But then God sent His Son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God gives us his Son, Jesus Christ. And if we believe in Jesus Christ, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. His blood cleanses us, makes us new. We're a new creation. We have a new life. We have a new song. We have a new heart in Jesus Christ. We have a reconciled relationship with the Father in heaven because of Jesus Christ. And if God was faithful to meet our greatest need, okay, why would we doubt that He would meet our lesser needs? So today's sermon has been about giving and receiving. So let's wrap it all up together. Let me say this. We must first understand that we are redeemed recipients of God's grace. That first and foremost, we through faith have received the grace of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And because we are redeemed recipients, we understand that we serve a generous God. That the God that we believe in, the God that we follow, is a generous God. And because the God that we serve is a generous God who gave us His Son, Jesus Christ, we can then turn around in this world and live our lives as generous people. That we can give gifts to others from the gifts we've received from God. In other words, what am I trying to say? That we can be grateful givers because we are redeemed recipients of God's grace. And I think what God's trying to teach us in, through today's sermon is that He wants us to understand that all of these gifts that we give to other people, whether it's a smile, whether it's a hug, whether we're offering up a prayer for them, whether we're giving someone in need a gift, or whether we're writing a check to the church, and whether we're serving the church, what's happening here? What we're really doing is repackaging what He's given to us in order for us to give to other people. But as we give to other people, God wants those people to know why it is that we're giving. We're giving because we have the love of Christ in us. God wants that when those people open those repackaged gifts that we're giving them in the name of Jesus Christ, that a card will fall out and they will look at the card and they will say, Oh, I see. You're giving to me because you've received the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. So here's what God wants us to do. God wants us, as we offer our presence to others, as we offer our presence to others, that we will, along with those presents, offer the presence of Christ. 
to those to whom we are giving. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, as we reflect on everything that we've talked about, everything that we've learned this morning, God, we are humbled to know that you loved us this much, that you gave us your precious Son. And that is through Christ that we have been reconciled to you, that whatever separated us from, from us from you has been removed, and now there's a bridge, there's an access, and his name is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray for anyone watching this sermon here online that has never given their life to Jesus Christ, has never received this gift of eternal life through Christ, that today would be the day of salvation, that this person would fall on their knees, and that they would commit their life to following Jesus Christ. And Father, for those who have already experienced this gracious gift of Christ, Lord, that today's sermon would be an opportunity for us to have a renewed desire to give towards the work of expanding your kingdom here on this earth. Father, thank you for all your promises that you have promised to meet all of our needs. If you gave us Jesus, you will give us all of our needs. Help us to be a people of faith. Help us to be a people full of love. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, Amen.
Okay, church, the time has come. Please stand up if you can stand. Make sure there's enough space between you and the person next to you. We don't want anyone getting hurt at home. At South Kendall Community Church, we're committed to doing three things, and we do use hand motions. We say reaching up, reaching in, and reaching out in the name of Jesus Christ. Are we ready? On the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Let's do it together. Reaching up, reaching in, and reaching out in the name of Jesus Christ. Our benediction today comes to us from the final verses in the book of Philippians. And let me tell you, it's been a great and wonderful study. You can go back and listen to all the sermons if you missed any of them on our YouTube channel. We've even set up a playlist for all of the sermons in Philippians. But here, the final promise, the final prayer of the Apostle Paul for all the believers in the city of Philippi, and it may, may it be the same prayer for all of you who are listening to today's sermon or service. Here it is. Are you ready? Philippians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for tuning in. And may God richly bless you this day and in this coming week.